So this is going to be another kind of difficult one to deal with because as with 1984, it's so dense. Every frame has so much going on. It's really hard to get into Watchmen <laughs> from an analytical standpoint because there's just so much about it to talk about. Now, I'm mainly going to be talking about the movie because I actually am maybe one of the few people who like the movie better than the graphic novel because I think it cleaned up a lot of aspects like that the graphic novel didn't do very well. Like in the graphic novel, they weren't actually like a superhero team. The Crime Busters, I think, fell apart after like one or two like meetings. But in the, sh in the movie, they were called the Watchmen and they actually worked together for an extended period of time. So I actually have to give them the credit for that. So that was uh, that was good. But yeah, um, I like the Watchmen movie. Uh, the first time I saw it, I thought it wasn't very good. But I rewatched it a couple months ago, and I, I really started to appreciate the movie. Maybe it's just the kind of thing that you appreciate more if you're kind of red pilled, because I think in a lot of ways it's kind of about as the the comedian as um. Night Owl says, whatever happened to the American dream? And uh, the comedian says it came true. This is the American dream. And, and I think that's kind of something where if you watch this, if you're a liberal or kind of a mainstream conservative, um, you just, it's, it's hard for to relate to it because it goes so against in a lot of ways your, your worldview. Now, I know Alan Moore is really left-wing and really weird, <clears throat> but he does have insights into to human nature and politics, often very right-wing insights. I, I think Watchmen, as with V for Vendetta and a lot of just similar stuff that tries to make fun of the right, shows off that the left doesn't understand the way we think at all. And there's a couple reasons for this. Part of it is part of their worldview and their kind of narrative of progress is that the current year is always right and what they believe in is always right and they they consider other and i did a video on this on boulevardism or um false consciousness they think people who disagree with them don't genuinely intellectually or morally disagree with them they are either using it to cover up some nefarious secret purpose or they think that way because they've been brainwashed. So they don't really attempt to understand other perspectives. Whereas people on the right, because we're surrounded by people on the left, I think we really do understand their worldview and what kind of the, the psychological factors are that motivate them. So when they try to parody the right, they largely, because they don't really understand, you have to understand something in order to parody it, but they don't. So they just will copy and paste right-wing talking points or that kind of thing and it'll become actually popular among people on the right because it's literally just copying and pasting things they support like if you look at young pope i think young pope was supposed to portray the main character as being like a psycho or some really scary evil person but because they don't understand how right-wing thought works they just basically copied and pasted a laundry list of stuff people on the right wanted and the show became popular for a completely opposite purpose than, from my understanding, what was intended. So that's all kind of interesting stuff. But I digress. So there's a lot of ways you can look at Watchmen. Um, you can look at it from a political, a psychological, what I'm going to do, which is a religious standpoint, interestingly enough. But it's very deep, and maybe I'll do some profiles on the individual characters. So what I do reaction reviews, I don't really try to cover everything about it. Um, if, it if it's a bit more of a story-driven thing or if it's a recent movie I've seen, I tend to do more of a talk about the narrative because a lot of people have asked me to do that because they don't want to pay money to see movies, so, but they enjoy hearing about the story. But for stuff like this where the story's really long, I can't really talk about the story. Plus, I think most people are familiar with the story of Watchmen, or you can easily look it up. It's The movie's widely available. But that being said, how do I kind of view it? What is kind of my um, takeaway from it? Uh, I think, to my mind, kind of the most interesting way to, to view the movie is to view the characters as different kinds of gods. 
because to a certain extent, that's what what he uh, superheroes kind of are. They're as uh, the one theory states, kind of the modern incarnation of the legendary hero. They're kind of where the divine meets the man, and in to a large extent, it's their purpose is to explore the consequences of power, the consequences of 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 a human being becoming basically like a god. And, and to kind of psychoanalyze, I suppose, God himself and kind of, I guess, kind of a more lower case G God and kind of see how do they deal with their, their abilities, how do they relate to humanity. Like, um, that was the thing I really liked about Superman versus Batman is I thought they, they did an interesting job in trying to deal with Superman basically being a, a messianic figure and a god among men when he when he knew that he wasn't and how he kind of reconciled his desire to be the protector of humanity with his reluctance to be worshipped so it, it, this was theme was really kind of fleshed out in the title of injustice gods among us because that's kind of what superheroes are so let's kind of just start going through them i think i'll start maybe with the the characters that are, are harder to do just to get them out of the way so the hardest character in this to psychoanalyze by far is Lori, uh, a.k.a. Silk Spectre 2. Because Lori doesn't really have a defined personality. She's a liberal and a feminist, but outside of kind of her relationship to Dr. Manhattan and her kind of need to be, um, to get fulfillment by having someone love her and take care of her and cherish her, she has this need to be worshipped, but aside from that, she doesn't have a, a very defined personality. So how do I kind of relate that back to my theme? I, I think you can kind of view her as representing the person or the god who finds themselves as a god, but isn't really able to existentially deal with it. Okay, they're a god, they're a deity, they've, they've achieved this immense power but they never really desired it um, to, to the extent that they they actively kind of reject it and they try to run away from it. And I, I think that's kind of the best thing we can say about Lori, because unlike the other characters, she really doesn't seem to have much of a desire for glory or desire to serve some higher purpose. Because you have some characters like Ozymandias or Roshox who have kind of an ideology that they're attempting to put forward, and then you have uh, the comedian or night owl who have a lot of personal fantasy and personal preference that have involved in them being a hero. But Lori more or less doesn't like being a superhero. She kind of rejects it. She was happy when she retired and she doesn't define herself by her achievements or her abilities. Uh, she defines herself and how her relationship to other people, specifically night owl or Dr. Manhattan, or whoever her boyfriend of the moment is. So that's probably about the best thing I can say about her, is she kind of, in my view, represents a deity who is not comfortable with the idea of being a deity, and to a certain extent kind of resents it and wants to escape from it and give the authority to someone else. So after that, we have the comedian, who I guess is the, the next most difficult person to um, look at. He kind of reminds me in, in some respects of kind of an Eastern deity, like a, a Hindu god or a Hindu demon, because despite his immense power, despite his just ability to kill pretty much anyone, he's kind of an ubermensch. In the movie, at least, the Watchmen seem to have superpowers, or at least inhuman strength, endurance, etc. And between that and his license to kill, he can pretty much go anywhere and do anything. But besides that, he can't escape from the, the fundamentals of reality, despite basically being a god. Um, he's still going to die. He can still get hurt. He still has human psychological problems. And he still can't make a difference to the way the universe is kind of turning. And that's something you frequently see with Hindu gods and demons, is they're all subject to the law of karma. They're all limited in their power. Even if they're able to, to shape worlds in their hands, they're still probably going to die one day. And that inevitability and that kind of inherent instability lurks over them. 
And I think in Japanese philosophy, if I rec recall, there's like the five, uh, the six paths of exi uh, six paths of pain. No, I'm no, I'm just joking. But six realms of existence, and the highest is the gods, and the second highest are the demigods, and they're pretty much immortal. But eventually, they they too die, and they cannot escape from the cycle of death and rebirth. And actually, there it's harder for them than it is for humans to escape from the cycle of death and rebirth, uh, because they can't learn humility. So, what does this have to do with the comedian? I think to a certain extent that explains some of his his cynicism uh, towards the world, is that he, despite his powers, is just a puppet of the U.S. government. Is just a puppet of of hum of uh, history. And as depraved as he is, he's kind of in line with the rest of of humanity. The um, I don't think the whole idea of why he sees the world as a joke is particularly well um, explained or described throughout the film and the comic book. I think his character could definitely use some more developing, but that's kind of how I see him, is his view of kind of the irony of the situation is despite being a superhero, despite being beloved, etc., he's just as corrupt and shitty as everybody else. And ultimately, he's kind of powerless to stand against fate. So kind of in the center between the kind of more abstract godlike figures like Rorschach and uh, Ozymandias and kind of the two more human ones, uh, we have Night Owl. Now, Night Owl is interesting because he's kind of the god figure people want. Um, he's compassionate, he's gentle, he's forgiving, he, he has human flaws, but he, he's basically kind of harmless. He just kind of wants what's best for people, and he's, he's unwilling to really make extreme decisions. Like, if, if he was in the Old Testament, he wouldn't have wiped out the various tribes Israel was facing down. He wouldn't be the one who will come at the end of judge with fire and sword. He's just kind of a, a benevolent but not particularly strong figure. And, and I think to a large extent, that's what people want God to be. They want him to be their friend. They want him to be their buddy. And when you look at Night Owl, probably of all the characters, he's the least kind of immoral. He's the least morally ambiguous. He has, like I said, a natural compassion, a natural humanity to him that most of the other characters are lacking. The problem with him, though, is... All of this kind of makes him ineffectual in his role as a superhero and as a god. Kind of a bit like Batman, in a sense. He's, he's not capable of really achieving anything long term. Because to achieve something great, to change the course of history in the world, requires sacrifice. Um, both of a collective and as of an individual nature. You have to, in essence, burn a bit of your humanity on the fire of... Um, of justice or whatever in order to get things done uh, when we get to the the next three superheroes they have to a certain extent changed the world but in doing so they've lost a large component of what originally made them human and they've willingly made this change but night owl isn't willing to do that so i think kind of a world ruled by him would in some ways be gentler but it would also be a world in which i think the the strong would prey upon the weak and in which there just wouldn't be the control and the ability to maintain, I guess, the kind of world that we'd all want. It's kind of hard to describe, to be honest, but I hopefully you kind of get what I'm getting at. So next we kind of move to Ozymandias, and he's once again kind of an enigmatic figure. I think the basis of his ideology is not only kind of narcissism, but pragmatism. Uh, in a lot of ways, he's probably the most cynical character as he vu views everything through the lens of utilitarianism. Um, his, his entire plan was what he thought was overall best for humanity. And in doing so, he's indifferent to morality, to justice, to the truth, to kind of any higher concept beyond what he views as utilitarian concerns for man. Like, he's willing to fool the public and that he's creating a, an energy source when he's actually creating Dr. Manhattan. He uses Dr. Manhattan to blow up a city in order to stop a nuclear war. He actually drove Dr. Manhattan off the planet to make the nuclear war more likely to happen. 
and in general, he's just willing to kill anybody who gets in his way, um, including the scientists who built his machine. And he just seems to have no actual empathy for other people. And a lot of his, his attempts to show empathy for other people, like his charitable work, his um, vegetarianism and his, his liberalism seem more like kind of a form of virtue signaling or trying to make people believe that he cares about humanity. There's kind of an open-ended question as to whether he does have any genuine concern for humanity or if he just views it as his role, because I think he very much sees himself as humanity's god, um, whether or not he sees it his role as humanity's god to take care of them just to show off how powerful he is. Because there's really kind of a megalomania at the heart of him. And he kind of tries to embody this image of this kind of aloof but glorious and all-powerful figure who's there to guide and watch over man. And I think to a certain extent he kind of resembles, I guess, kind of a higher pagan deity, kind of after it went through a lot of reforms and they removed a lot of the more degenerate aspects. He also, in well, he took the name Ozymandias, tries to resemble a god king. So next, let's talk about Roshox. Now, Roshox is very obviously, I'm not sure if Ellen more directly meant this, but he's very obviously the god of the Old Testament. He is a kind of a puritanical god. He is a, a figure that is utterly moral, utterly just, utterly honest, and utterly incorruptible. Roshox lives in a hovel. He has no money, and he eats canned beans out of Night Owl's fridge. And, but he, So his entire career has seen absolutely no personal gain for himself. He lives an extremely Spartan, austere life. And he's completely fine with that. He doesn't really mind going through deprivation. He, he doesn't have any personal interest in, in doing justice. He just believes he's doing justice solely for its own sake. And... I think a world run by Roshax would be a much better world. It would be a world in which um, evil is destroyed and punished, where humans are more honest, and, and kind of a world in which people are better. At the same time, it would be a world that I think tries to make humans into something they're not, into kind of these, these perfect beings. And I don't say that to um, to denigrate Roshox because he is, as I'm sure most people who watch his favorite character, and he is based. But he really does try to embody the God of the Old Testament, who judges with fire and sword, who strikes down people for their sins. And and what makes him kind of frightening is he's he is just in it. Uh, the people he kills are almost always people who deserve it, and. He pray he attacks he protects society from the worst parts of humanity. Finally, we get to Doctor Manhattan, who is very much the Deus Ex Machina. He's the god in the machine. He is the god of the deists. He he is kind of a creator figure. He's an all powerful figure, but he's completely aloof from the universe. He views humans as being some kind of strange accident and a curiosity. He doesn't really place, at least at the beginning, any inherent worth in human life, in consciousness, in morality, in anything. He's completely remote and distant. I suppose you could kind of compare him to some earlier conceptions of the Demiurge, or kind of some of like Enlightenment deism conceptions of God. He's just there to set things in motion, and then to just basically watch, or even show complete disinterest. Now, what's kind of interesting is how he comes to care for humanity is that he realizes that Lori came about as a result of two extremely different people having sex by chance and that all of humanity is the product of something that random and mathematically improbable. Which is, I gotta say, a very autistic way of looking at it. But I think it just kind of resembles or, or kind of exemplifies his remote and distant nature from humanity. So that's kind of my attempt to analyze Watchmen. I know it probably wasn't that good, but it is what it is. I had to cover this at some point, and that was kind of what I was able to come up with. So, uh, yeah, uh, see the movie, and I'll talk to you guys later.